I'll take that. Those are my notes, my cheat sheets. Yeah. All right, we're going to get going here again. I'm going to give an overview of the technical guidance document. And before I started, though, I, I thought I would ask uh, how many people had heard of the term LID uh, before we came in today? I know some of you are grizzled veterans, so you have. How many, I should say how many, how many didn't for low impact development? No, oh, the cameraman, that's good. And then uh, how, about, how about hydro modification? Is that a, how many didn't really know that word very well? Okay, well, you guys seem like a pretty uh, knowledgeable audience then on some of this stuff. Well, anyway, lo LID stands for low impact development. It's basically a technique or set of techniques to try to reduce the run surface runoff volumes from a project. And when we talk about hydro modification, what we're trying to do there is manage the runoff from a site or a watershed in such a way that I don't cause impacts to stream systems. You know, it would be a real, real general way to say that. So, so I'm going to introduce the technical guidance document, which gets into some of those things. I'm actually going to start out showing some pictures so we uh, uh, get it all in our heads what these things might look like, and then um, specifically talk about how the document's organized and then the resources that it, that it provides uh, provides for folks. So, um, in the training, and where this fits into the training program is I'm going to give an introductory model on the technical guidance document. As Don mentioned, the upcoming training will have a process overview module as well as a technical focus. Uh, and that, that's where uh, we'll get into a lot more details here. So I'm not going to get into a ton, ton of details today. I put a bonus slide in here, so you don't have this in any handouts that you've seen. But this is just a little uh, conceptual sketch of what goes on on a land surface and associated uh, receiving waters and groundwater. So, in essence, when it rains, uh, what happens to that precipitation? Well, it either uh, evapotranspirates back up into the air, so it hits some little leaf or uh, interception storage, it's called, on the surface, or even evapotranspirates through the root structures of plants, so a number of different ways that it evapotranspirates. It can also infiltrate deeper, or it can run off. Um, and so the permit, what the permit really get at, gets after is, how do I manage runoff? Uh, you know, what, what the aim is is try to reduce the amount of runoff uh, as much as possible and the associated pollutant loadings with it. So some of our tools to do that are maximize infiltration and maximize evapotranspiration. And the way the permit's laid out is you have to look at evapotranspiration for, you know, these together, but infiltration, evapotranspiration, or actually harvesting and using the water, say like for irrigation or toilet flushing. And then if those things aren't feasible, you know, the next thing you can go to is bio-treat and release. And I'll show some pictures of that. And then if that's not feasible, then you go to putting in some kind of a BMP. So, so again, this goal is to try to, the goal of the permit is to try to reduce this runoff volume. But there's a lot of other issues and, and a lot of what the technical guidance document about is getting in, into, you know, well, how feasible is it to infiltrate? You know, is it a good idea or not, you know? Can you do it? You know, it, should you do it? Are some questions. You know, evapotranspiration is one that's um, it's difficult with any kind of density on a development. You're just not going to match the pre-development evapotranspiration rates. You know, uh, evapotranspiration is really governed by how much surface area you have, along with the storage, but mostly it's a surface area function. So if I'm you know building sites out with eight, 70 or 80 percent. A roof area or a pavement or whatever, you're just not going to match e ET rates. So, the bo the bottom line is then, you know, how do you how do you actually then reduce runoff and either either infiltrate and potentially sometimes more than natural. So we have to think about that, or deal with runoff issues. So this is my little editorial comment on some of this. Um, so not not the county's opinion, necessarily. So surface water uh, regulators and environmental groups want to push stormwater into the ground as much as possible or evapotranspirate it. Water regulators and users are concerned about this. So here's a little uh, dirty raindrop, right? And you've got your uh, uh, NRDC and the regulators trying to push it in the ground. <laughs> and you have the groundwater regulators and the water agencies that are trying to push it up. And you know the poor raindrop is screaming, wondering where to go. So I, th I thought that would be sort of a useful bonus slide to throw in there and kind of frame the subject a bit. And, I, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, you can step back and look and say, God, this thing's complicated. Why are we doing all this? And, you know, ultimately the goals are good is try to get closer back to where we should be on discharge volumes and, 
and, and factoring that into how we manage runoff from a site and all the rest of it, I think a lot of us in the room here would agree that um, some of the constraints that the permit has and, and particularly some of the constraints that some of the environmental groups would like to see start taking some really good tools out of the toolbox but also could lead to some other impacts that might not necessarily be good ones, be it economic all the way to uh, unnatural infiltration levels and things like that. So, so I'm going to go through a little gallery of some of uh, low impact development controls. This is a little localized on, -light, uh, on lot infiltration. Some people would call that a rain garden. You know, you just allow the runoff to get into that little area and soak into the ground. You can disperse uh, runoff from paved areas into associated landscaped areas is another technique. And these are actually techniques that are described in the guidance. Um, you can have uh, the street canopy and, and cover. Actually, I mentioned rainfall hitting leaves and then evapotranspirating back up. You know, for small drizzly events like we had this morning, or even a little harder than that, a lot of runoff on, or a lot of precipitation that would hit a tree wouldn't actually make it to the ground and end up back up in the air again. And, and folks have done studies looking at that. There's the use of residential rain barrels, you know, capture the water and then, and then use it for irrigation. There's some challenges around that because we typically get storms on the west coast that come in batches so you get all this rainfall at the same time and it's it's hard to then irrigate it uh, use it for irrigation in, in a reasonable uh, time period uh, there's green roofs or, or what we folks would call brown roofs again so putting vegetation on the roof you know one advantage of that is we get some uh, 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 interception area for precipitation and then evapotranspir it back up in the air and actually if you did a, a big d downtown lot to lot project in a full green roof that would be considered pretty much self-mitigating in terms of having to do anything. You know, obviously there's some other considerations with roofs having to irrigate them and manage even for fire control. There's all kinds of other issues. Blue roof is one where you just store water on the roof and, and use it like a cistern. Uh, there's infiltration BMPs. So here's a little infiltration ba basin. I've actually seen some of these where folks will make a volleyball court into an infiltration basin, which I think is kind of nice because then you've, you've got people's feet that are actually breaking up the surface uh, layer to keep the infiltration rates up. You know, I don't know what's getting on their feet, but um, and then infiltration trenches. So areas here uh, where you can bring water into and beneath here, there's a trench uh, full of gravel that infiltrates into the ground. Uh, there's bioretention without under drains, so uh, surf, uh, surface runoff is, is uh, relayed into areas like this and then allowed to soak into the ground. You can have biofiltration with under drains, so this is showing an inter under drain here. We actually show a layer here of storage that's available as well um, to do some infiltration, but it gets up to a certain level and would start discharging out of the system. So this would be a good one to use when you can't, it, you can infiltrate a little bit, but not a lot. There's dry wells, uh, you know, so you have to have very good soils to use dry wells, but in, in, in some locations that might be applicable, uh, a few. <laughs> and then permeable pavements. This is actually a picture of the um, Inland Empire Utilities uh, District offices, and this is some per, uh, permeable pavement they have out in their, one of their parking lots. Um, you can enhance infiltration by creating storage. This is just a little, uh, I forget the brand name of these things, but. Uh, Essentially, you, you can put a pavement a surface over the top of this, and then you create essentially detention that then can infiltrate into the ground or, you know, chambers like this to do the same kind of thing. Um, th this is showing some harvest and use. So here's an above ground cistern. So rainwater is routed from a roof into these series of tanks and used for irrigation. This is a, bo a below ground uh, cistern actually at the uh, Pelican Hills Resort right next to the golf course. Uh, I helped design this project. It's, uh, the cisterns can capture up to 1.2 inches of rainfall from the resort watershed, and then that water is used to irrigate the golf course greens. And greens, they actually start irrigating within 24 to 36 hours after the end of rainfall, so we could actually show a good use for, uh, for irrigation levels. And this golf course was, you know, so here's another issue you get into. This golf course was being irrigated with reclaimed water. So the golf course guys love it because the, the greens get some nice low, uh, uh, t low TDS or low salt uh, water to irrigate with on occasion. You know, IRWD might not be so enamored with it because it starts reducing the amount of reclaim that gets used for irrigation. So sort of example of some of the trade-offs. These are some bioretention. Uh, with under drains over, over here, this is actually right next to a, 
an a, 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 a apartment building in Portland, but there's uh, under drains out over here, where, as well as little overflows. So this is treating uh, primarily roof runoff. These are actually in the Crystal Cove uh, the development in the parking lot uh, right near the, one of the rec centers. So this takes parking lot runoff and, and routes it into this little area. And then here's some vegetated swales. Oops, now I hit the wrong button. How do I, uh, there we go. Uh, so this gets uh, runoff into it from various areas and it flows through this vegetated area. Here's one also in Crystal Cove, actually a 6% slope on the road, so pretty steep, but this is managed by only letting so much water in from the road. Uh, gets down to a certain point and then drops it into the storm drainage system and also there's little check dams and things in here so these the slope on the swales isn't quite as uh, high as the slope on the road surface there so here's some bio treatment type things uh, vegetated filter more bio treatment vegetated filter strips wet detention ponds this is somewhat similar to a lot of the nts na natural treatment system master plan facilities that are out there in the san diego creek watershed um, Here's a constructed wetland. This is actually the freshwater marsh at Playa Vista, uh, just north of LAX. It, it treats runoff from about a 500, no, 1,000 acre catchment, 500 acres of a project site and 500 acres of offsite. And then this, uh, this slide here is a dry extended detention pond. Um, there are some proprietary biotreatment BMPs. Uh, this is a little catch basin sort of plant filter. The water runs into this catch basin uh, area and it actually soaks down through a, a soil media mixture that this plant's growing in. Oftentimes these, sometimes these will put in with another regular catch basin in, in entrance downstream of here. So this takes up to a certain amount of runoff and deals with the rest. And similar kind of system here where runoff can, can come in and then uh, gets into this media mixture and then uh, down below and out through the catch basin. So I thought it'd be useful to just, you know, what do these things look like a little bit before we start getting into all the fun, uh, fun details here. Any, any little brief questions on any of those things that I just talked about or seeing none, I'll, uh, I'll move on. So the purpose of the technical <coughs> guidance document is really to help people develop their project WQMPs and um, pro you know, provide some practical uh, objective interpretation of what the permit requires and, uh, and a recommended process to go through. I mentioned earlier that you have to you know, go through this feasibility criteria analysis and and determine you know, if you can do uh, retain on site or keep the water from, I, I hate that term retain on site because the water is going to go somewhere, but it, it, that's, the, that's the term that gets used. But it's really can I manage surface runoff or, or, or minimize or eliminate surface runoff. The other thing you'll note though is I don't know how many people have actually uh, downloaded this thing and printed it out, but you know, there's a lot of pages here. This is double sided. Um, so some people might say, why the heck is it so complicated? Well, part of the reason for that is the challenges that we knew we we're going to have defending this uh, program, both to the board and their staff, as well as the environmental community and maybe someday in court. Um, so it had to be, you can imagine, although it sounds pretty simple, you know, can you infiltrate or should you? When you start getting into the details, there's a lot to get into and, and have in there. So this document is as much a justification for the program and, and where we went with it as it is a, as a, a guidance document. So, uh, and, and in try, trying to address that some, we tried to, to uh, uh, simp, you know, make, make it such that folks could get in and use part of the document that makes sense for them to use and not have to get into all the a whole document if they don't, you know, if they don't need to. Um, so it has uh, supporting information for BMP selection and design. So uh, maybe I, I, I probably touched on, on this a bit, but again, what's the difference between retaining water on site or, or min, you know, minimizing surface discharges versus biotreat and release? So in this photo here, this is a, a, bio, a, ret, a, a retention system. Water comes into it, infiltrates down into the ground. So I've got good soils underneath. I can do it and maintain it. Where here's another sort of uh, bio, it's a biotreatment system, so it can be fairly similar in design. This happens to have curbs around it, but uh, in a little more urban, most of parking lot, and this is a street, but similar in design, but instead now I have the under drains here. And again, that's for reasons, uh, either poor soil conditions or I've got contaminated issues underneath the site or whatever it is that you know, limits uh, infiltration ability. So a lot of what the feasibility criteria is about is when can I pass through this gate where I'm actually allowed to use one of these instead of having to infiltrate or evapotranspirate or, or harvest and use. Um, 
So again, we provide a rigorous technical defense of the criteria that are in there. Uh, we're trying to accommodate uh, lots of different project scenarios. Um, also, because the North Orange County permit and the South uh, Orange County permit have differences, we, we try to uh, both separate and bridge those uh, uh, when it makes sense. And we've tried to you know, make it usable as well. So hopefully, as folks get into this, you might start agreeing with it more than you're probably agreeing with it when you, uh, you know, hoist this thing up like this. <laughs>